Hello everyone, um, welcome to a quick tutorial on how to do ProRes RAW dailies in Scratch. Um, before we start, let's go to the System Settings, Advanced tab and search for Color Management. Um, to make things easy at the beginning, uh, I would recommend to disable the color management in Scratch. It makes a few things just a bit more straightforward and more expected at the beginning. So let's create a new project, call this Zcam ProRes RAW, hit create and set our media directory to the folder containing those raw files. Um, our main output will be Rec709 and everything else I'll just leave as is. Hit OK, hit enter project and import a clip. Quick heads up here, if you want to import a complete folder of clips, make sure to enable the select folder button here and that will allow you to, well, select a folder instead of single clips. And now let's import this one for instance. Drop it right in here and Scratch automatically asks us whether we want to change our timeline resolution, frame rate, etc. Yes, we do. And drop the clip in here. Now you can either double click the clip or go straight to one of the tabs here at the bottom. If I go to edit and go to audio and pull this up a little, you can see we have four audio channels with this file. And if I go to color fix, I can start grading the clip. Two important hotkeys with alt and drag up and down, you can scale in and out. And with space drag, you can position the clip the version stack here can be flipped into the metadata stack so you can get some info on the metadata of the source file but for now I'll just swipe it away like such on the left we have the layer stack that you can swipe in which we also don't need right now let me move the image over to the side and bring up our scopes okay so let's first have a look at decoding the file and go to the QuickTime menu here and you can see it's detected as Apple ProRes RAW and here is the color space and EOTF that we're decoding to. Now Scratch recognized that this is a Zcam ProRes RAW file so uh, it decodes to Zcam Gamut and also to Zlog. However, um, both are still work in progress so for the time being, I'll go with Ari Log C and decode to that. Now the advantage of this is that you can use all the lookup tables and what have you more uh, for a Log C workflow. Um, anyways, uh, let's have a look at this. So now we're looking at a log image and we can see there's, there's a lot of dynamic range in there. And all we basically have to do is uh, use the grading tools to uh, grade the file and make it look good. So in here, I can just dial in some S-curve. S-curve is really great because it adds contrast without letting anything clip. I'll maybe do it just like that. Brighten up the scene using the gamma. The numeric controls are uh, really a bit nicer to work with if you don't have a grading panel. If you have a grading panel, just go here to the primary tab and use the color wheels which you can also use actually. If I hold down J, K and L, I can highlight the color wheels and with the mouse wheel or scroll function of my trackpad, I can move the ring and if I just click and drag over the image, I can move the ball as you can see. Now let's add some more saturation in, something like this. And this looks fairly decent. Let's get rid of the scopes image into the middle. Well, maybe the orange, orange cards here pop a little bit too much, so we could go ahead to the curves, for instance, choose our hue set curves, enable pick, and now just click and drag the saturation of these cards down a little. All right, not too terrible for starters. Let's look at a different file. Go back to import and select this file. Now, as you can see, this is quite overexposed. And uh, looking at it, uh, let's let's debire it to log C as well. 
So we can see that there's quite a lot of information in there and there's actually not that much clipped in the file itself. So here again, we can go ahead and dial in some contrast like such. Lighten it a little bit, add saturation. You know, and this actually already looks pretty decent. So this way you can quickly grade those files. We could take this a little bit further, like, uh, well, obviously this is, this is now very balanced, but if we want a summer feeling to go with it, let's give it some warmth here, something like this. And now the water is not as blue, so we could go to our vectors. And you have this grid in here, which you can set to log in this case, because that's what our image source is. Um, and we could, for instance, move the blue from the blue more over to cyan, like that. We can also grab the lower saturated image parts and drag them out to increase the saturation a little bit. Something like that. And if we switch to the set loom grid here, enable the pick function, go in here, and make it a little bit darker, the water here. And go somewhere here. Yeah, that doesn't look too bad. Bypass. Yeah, I'm quite happy with that. Okay, what else could we do? Well, let's let's maybe create a layer, really. And now do changes on the layer. We could go here and saturate the dock here a little bit more, bring out the warm wooden tones, create another layer, go to canvas, set this to circle, scale the circle down a little bit, add softness to it, invert it, and now create a nice little vignette, dialing in some contrast with the S-curve, bringing down gamma just a little, maybe scaling it down again a little. Oh yes, by the way, uh, you can dial in these values by clicking and circling around, just like turning an encoder, which is a really convenient way to change numeric parameters. By hitting the overlay button, you can get rid of the canvas outline. If I now enable and disable that layer, I can see the before and after without the disturbing canvas lines here. If I hit G on my keyboard or hit this um, barcode here, I can disable the grade and look at the before and after. And that's mainly it. Now we just have to get everything out of scratch again. So let me go to the render tab. And this is our main output node and it basically represents our timeline in terms of resolution, aspect, frame rate, etc. So what I'm going to do is just, uh, well, Right now we're in Ultra HD, as you can see. If I wanted to render uh, my output at a smaller resolution, I would add a transformer node and set that transformer node to 1080 and 50 frames per second. But as you can see, right now we're creating a center cut. So let's go to the format settings, scaling and select fit width. And now, as you can see, we're scaling the content down to HD on this node. And after this node, we can now add a DNX encoder for Avid dailies or H.264 or ProRes or what have we. Uh, actually, let's go with a ProRes encoder. You also have this ProRes encoder in the Windows version of Scratch, by the way. And same here, if we go to the format settings of this node, the ProRes encoder node, I can choose my ProRes flavor, let's set this to 422LT, and also enable our four audio tracks. Back to the output settings, the only thing left to do basically is the output file name. As you can see right now I'm rendering a file called timeline1.transform.prorescencoder.mov. Not really what we want. Um, if you click inside here it brings up the file name specification and it says hashtag name. Hashtag name means it uses the name of this output node which currently this. So if I call this ProRes 
render, I will now render a progress render.moth. In any case, this will give me one big file with both of these clips in. However, I obviously want them separate. So what I'll do is remove the hashtag name here. Obviously, you can type anything in here, whatever you want. But you can also choose any of these metadata items here, like source name, for instance. If I insert that, which is just S name instead of name, now Scratch will use the source name of each clip for the output file name. And this will force Scratch to render separate clips. Why is that? Well, uh, this clip name, as you can see, is uh, take 14 at the end, and the next clip is take 34 at the end. So the source name changes from clip to clip, and hence the output file name will also change from clip to clip. And this way, Scratch will render individual clips. Now you can also combine that with, um, uh, if you want, that is, um, for instance, do hashtag date and uh, separate the two with an underscore or a slash. So now Scratch will create a folder based on the current date and inside render all the clips with their respective source file name. You can save that file mask that we typed in here as a template over here. And you can also save your output tree if you want. If you select the main output node and then type in a name, something like this, and save it here. And if you create a new timeline, you can apply that tree just like that. Well, now all that's left to do is select the ProRes render node and either render it straight away or add it to the queue. And if we go to the render queue, here's our node and we can either start the selected item or start the queue. If there's more than one output node in there, it will just start rendering one after another. And while Scratch is rendering, we can actually go to the next timeline and import other clips if we want and work on, a, on different footage. All right, that's basically it. Um, I, let me stop this real quick on my old MacBook from 2012. It doesn't perform too well. Um, yes, that's it. I hope this uh, was useful to you. Uh, give Scratch a try. It's free until end of October. Just head over to www.assimilateinc.com and uh, get your free version right from there. Okay, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye.